Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing Series. I'm Tom Gilligan, director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, the Hoover Institution and world-renowned library and archives have been collecting knowledge and generating ideas that support the pursuit of freedom, freedom and endeavor to improve the human condition. We've been able to occupy an eminent place in the think tank landscape by maintaining a focus on scholarly and empirical research that asks bold questions, offers powerful solutions for policymakers, and advances ideas to improve people's lives. These briefings are just one of the many ways we're able to reach out and share some of the important work coming out of the institution. Thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, we will be taking audience questions and I encourage you to submit yours using the Q&A button located at the bottom of the screen. Today's discussion is with Russian historian and political commentator, Robert Service. Robert is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a fellow of St. Anthony's College at Oxford. His research interests concern Russian history and politics in all its aspects from the late 19th century to the present day. In 2009, Bob was awarded the Duff Cooper Prize for his biography entitled Trotsky. Bob, thanks for joining us today. I'm so glad you could be here. My pleasure. And you're joining us from uh, merry old England, I take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> London N8, yeah. Good for you, good for you. Well, let's dive right into it. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our discussion on Russia. Can you start by laying a foundation for us? What do we need to know about President Putin? In particular, can you explain the recent constitutional amendments that he's proposed? Will he be president for the rest of our lives? Well, uh, we don't know really whether he, he aspires just to be president for life or not. That is definitely one possibility because he's got lots of uh, ill-gotten gains that he wants to protect. And if he's out of power, it'll be more difficult to protect them. That's one possibility. Another is that he is worried that the ruling group that he heads might disintegrate into conflicting factions as contenders set themselves up to succeed him. And the business elite and the political elite uh, are quite capable of, of that. So the other possibility is that he is a little bit more reluctant to stay on in office, but he, he wants the new Russia that he's helped to create to, to maintain its relative stability. And that's what he's up to with these mm -hmm. constitutional uh, amendments. Whether he'll get sufficient numbers of Russians to go out onto the streets at a time of COVID to, to put their um, ballot in the box in favor of him, that's, a, that's another question. That really is a big question. Is there, a, is there a constitutional requirement that a certain percentage of, of Russians vote in favor of the amendments? Well, strictly speaking, uh, this is not a referendum. This mm -hmm. is an all Russia popular poll. Mm -hmm. So there is no, um, there is no um, constitutional requirement about it. Mm -hmm. But what there is, is a lot of prestige at stake. And if over half the Russian electorate refuse to turn out, then he'll have to turn to fiddling. And in every election that he's been uh, involved in, there have, there have been uh, manifestly lots of cases of electoral fraud. And, and I dare say that's what's quite possibly going to happen. Yeah, got it. Can I ask you, uh, you mentioned that you use this phrase ruling groups in Russia. Um, there are ruling groups that support Putin. Are there ruling groups that actively oppose Putin or stand ready to support a challenger should that challenger emerge? Well, I think that's a really uh, important question, Tom. 
Uh, there have been very prominent challenges, including one of his own former prime ministers, Mikhail Kasyanov. Uh, people who espouse the cause of some kind of economic liberalism and a freer and more democratic form of capitalism. Uh, he's eliminated them from having any influence mm -hmm. on, on the ruling group itself. The, the businessmen and the politicians inside the ruling group, mm -hmm. they share the vision of Russia that Putin has. And when people become uh, prominent in opposition, something bad tends to happen to them. Yeah. In the case of Kasyanov, he was discredited by a sex video. In the case of Boris Nemtsov, he was assassinated in circumstances that are still un unclear. Uh, in the case of the, the, the one surviving leading oppositionist, Alexei Navalny, uh, he was brought up in court on a charge of embezzlement, and that pre precludes him from standing in an election against uh, Putin. I don't think he'd win even if he did stand, mm -hmm. but um, that's the kind of autocratic politics that yeah. Russia has. Right. Bob, you told me earlier that Putin's popularity rating, at least as reflected by questions asked Russians about how much they trust him, has fallen to an all-time low, I take it. Uh, could you could you kind of tell us a little bit about that is and what the sources of that are? And in fact, does, does the recent fall in oil prices and the difficult circumstances that that has created for Russia, is that part of Putin's current unpopularity? His popularity peaked, Tom, uh, at the time of the Crimean annexation. That was a tremendously popular policy. Uh, amidst the, the Russian electorate. But just months after that, the gas and oil revenues started to fall because of the world market. And as a result of that, uh, there was a, a fall off in welfare benefits for many people, uh, a threat to the pensions of the older parts of the population and there were disturbances on the streets uh, and on the buses and on public transport. So uh, Putin's, Putin's popularity steadily went down in 2017, 2018, 2019 uh, and now trust in him has fallen to about 25 to 26 percent now this mm. this is from a high of 89 percent mm. uh, in 2019 mind you it's staggering that someone who's been in power for 20 years has a shred of popularity left yeah. so uh, we can't we can't exclude the possibility of a of a bounce back but um he's in more trouble now than he's than he's ever been in the public uh, public image that he has in Russia. Yeah. Bob, I have an interesting question from Christian. He asked, have there been some economic, some Russian economic, political, or social reforms that have been carried out by Putin that went beyond Gorbachev or Yeltsin? That's a really interesting question. Um, uh, Putin does believe in capitalism. Gorbachev believed in socialism and the market eco economy, but he didn't like using the word capitalism. Actually, Putin doesn't like using the word capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but he has reformed um, uh, land ownership. Uh, he's uh, introduced uh, changes uh, to various aspects of the economy um, in the direction of widening market uh, preferences. So he's by no means against the market. The problem is, 
that his idea of the market is of um, giving privileges to uh, big corporations that are under state control. Okay. So the form of capitalism that Russia has is what we might call state capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, the recourse to the law on the part of people who fall foul of the ruling elite is very, very difficult indeed. In fact, it's negligible. Um, so he has made reforms. Um, it's very important not to, to make a cartoon figure out of Putin. Um, he's actually anti-communist. He's one of these, he's one of these anti-communists though, who says, let's remember the better things about communism. So he's a complex political uh, phenomenon. Um, um, he, he has reformed, but he ceased to really commit himself to further reforms. And when, he's, when he talks about uh, the need for the rule of law, nobody believes him. I see. Are, how much are his reforms motivated by what you refer to as ill-gotten gains? I mean, his, his opportunity to exploit, um, I guess, state-owned enterprises within Russia. Um, both he and the big businessmen and the big politicians mm -hmm. expect to feather their own nests, and they do feather their own nests. Um, they build huge, sumptuous palaces. Ministers aren't meant to uh, have outside commercial interests, but they all do. Mm -hmm. this, this is the um, tacit rule of the game, that if, if you're um, in public life, then you can siphon off uh, huge benefits that that you haven't achieved by your professional um, or commercial acumen. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a very, very corrupt form of, of uh, capitalism uh, in Russia. And this sort of capitalism is much resent, it's given capitalism a bad name. <laughs> Uh, if you're just joining us, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is the Hoover Institution's Virtual Policy Briefing with Bob Service. Bob, let's talk a bit about Ukraine-Russia relations. Uh, what, what are the status? Is there a potential for reconciliation or, I guess, integration? Uh, how, what's the current status of uh, that particular hotspot in the world? Well, uh, we've taken our eye off the ball a bit, haven't we, mm -hmm. um, in regard to uh, Ukraine? There's there's a war going on in the eastern half of the country. Uh, Putin doesn't really regard eastern Ukraine as belonging to Ukraine. I thought he was cooling off on some of his rhetoric this time last year, but in December, he went to Paris and he talked to Ukrainian, the new Ukrainian president, Zelensky, about the need for peace and reconciliation and they were all smiles and handshakes but when he went home putin said on public television that he still believed that the the russians and the ukrainians were one people and that russia was bigger in the world when it was united and integrated with Ukraine. Now that might seem a sort of bland uh, and inoffensive thing uh, to say, but it's not to the Ukrainians. Yeah. This has the uh, underbelly of threat mm -hmm. that uh, what he said in the past about Ukraine not being a um, a legitimate territorial entity still motivates him. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's bigger than just Ukraine, of course, because if 
Eastern Ukraine falls, or the whole of Ukraine in some way, falls under the Russian aegis, then Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and even Poland will start to shiver mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. fear. So uh, Western powers, the Western alliance, has to really decide how it should draw up red lines beyond which uh, no deal is possible with Russia. I personally am in favor of talking, talking, talking to the Russians. Cultural exchanges, scientific exchanges, uh, friendly uh, gestures on both sides, but not enough has been done to lay down what are our uh, red lines. There's been far too much fuzziness there and Putin has taken advantage of this. Interesting, Bob, what, with the current stance of the West with respect to Crimea and the Ukraine, what do you see happening there over the next one or two years? If, if Putin is given the latitude to integrate those regions more clearly within the Russian sphere, will he do so? I, I think if he had half a chance, he would. Uh, one of the counterproductive things he's done, though, is to unite Ukrainian opinion against Russia. Uh, so people who were vacillating on one side or the other were horrified by what happened in eastern Ukraine from 2014 onwards. Ukrainian opinion then became united as never before against Russia. So he's, he's actually made a, uh, a long-term problem for himself. I don't think many Ukrainians would ever trust Russia again. Um, that said, um, how much, how much um, uh, can Putin risk Mm -hmm. by going deeper into the, um, the military morass mm -hmm. of Eastern Europe. I mean, if Russia had to take over, it decided to take over Eastern Ukraine, the economic costs would be enormous, much more than um, uh, Russia could bear, especially at the moment with... Uh, oil and gas revenues being so depressed for Russia. Yeah, got it. Bob, I want to uh, turn to the Middle East now, and I want to have you talk about Russian military activities in the Middle East. Um, you know, I'm talking about Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, those areas. Uh, I'm going to set it up with a, a question that Stephen asked. Stephen asked, how strong is Putin's interest in maintaining the presence of Syria and propping up the Assad regime? Well, that's a, uh, an excellent question again. Um, Russia, until the early 1980s, had client states in the Middle East in the form of Iraq and Syria. Uh, it lost them in the period of Gorbachev's perestroika, uh, but it still regards the Middle East as one of its legitimate zones of influence. And it's waded back in there, especially after the American diplomatic uh, withdrawal under President uh, Obama in particular. So he, it moved into that vacuum. It wants to be friends with everyone in the Middle East. It wants to be friends with Iran, with Turkey. It wants to prop up Assad's uh, Syria. At the same time, it wants a friendly relationship with Saudi Arabia and also with Israel. Now, these are conflicting interests uh, for uh, an outside power because all of these countries are, uh, are in, some, in some respects um, wanting to get at uh, the throats of, 
one or other uh, of those countries. So Russia sees Syria as being the country in the Middle East that is most amenable to Russian influence. But unlike um, America, when America was more involved in, in the Middle East, Russia lacks the economic uh, resources to regenerate um, a devastated country such as uh, Syria is. So the um, Russia's rising influence in, in Syria in particular is far from being unproblematic and Russia's maneuvers in the Middle East, they're much more difficult than we're often led to believe that they are. Mm -hmm. Bob, why is Putin partnering with Iran? What, what does he expect to gain from that partnership? I think any, any country that has um, uh, an antagonistic uh, approach to America mm -hmm. is game for an approach from Putin. Uh, and um, Iran has let it be known that it will not seek to uh, encourage jihadism in former Soviet Central Asia, so that the commercial ties between Iran and the military ties between Iran and Russia have become, have become possible as both sides say they won't unduly interfere in, in the other's uh, affairs. But the problem is that Russia also wants to be on friendly terms with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia and Iran are are deadly enemies. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there are clashes in interest between Turkey and, and Syria. So Russia is going into a maelstrom of problems in mm -hmm. that region of the world without the assets that it, uh, it, it, it requires in terms of soft power. Its image in the world is, yeah. is very poor after uh, Crimea, or in terms of the economy. The yeah. Russian economy is so dependent on oil and gas export revenues, and at the moment, they're not very, very substantial. Mm -hmm. Got it. Interesting. So if I heard you right, so the deal with Iran is uh, Iran promises not to, say, take for, former regions of the Soviet Union like uh, the stands, and not to promote jihadism there. And Russia is a supporter, at least military, militarily, in terms of Iran's interest in the Middle East. Yeah, and that whole, that whole sway that stands yeah. below uh, Siberia, that's a very sensitive area for Russian policy. Mm -hmm. So they have a deal with Iran, and that looked fairly settled until the Chinese, the new best friends of the Russians said, we wanna build a new uh, Silk Road across that very stretch of yeah. territories. Yeah. And, uh, well, let me ask you, Bob, since you, ra you raised China, let's uh, talk generally about the relationship between Russia and China. How tight is it? How cohesive are their interests? Or, or do they have some significant differences? Well, uh, one thing you won't get in the uh, Russian press very much is any criticism of China. Um, very few uh, works are produced even by uh, academically independent Russian scholars which um, question the 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 policy of a Russia-China mutual embrace. Um, but if you talk privately to leading Russians and you get them uh, in, uh, in confidential 
um, talks, then they they talk quite openly about the dangers posed by the huge economic power and expansionist ambitions that China possesses. How this has come about is largely because Russia fell out with America in the time of George W. Bush, uh, felt that uh, America had encouraged and indeed partly organized the color revolutions in Ukraine and in Georgia and color revolutions involving a greater degree of democracy are the last thing that the Russian ruling elite wants to see because uh, Russia does not have a, a, a functioning democratic order with functioning democratic uh, elections. If bordering countries formerly in the Soviet Union start to have functioning democracies, uh, then the contagion might spread to Russia. So ditch America uh, on um, many grounds, including suspicion that America still uh, wishes to interfere in Russia's backyard. Mm -hmm. And that only leaves one other great power in the world with which to have close friendly dealings, namely China. But it's, um, in my view, this is a huge gamble that Russia will lose because its economy is not as dynamic, nowhere near as dynamic in terms of technology, in terms of commercial dynamism as China, China's economy. So mm -hmm. uh, um, it's, it's a more one-sided relationship than Putin likes to pretend that it is. And Bob, that's interesting. I have a question from Bill. He says, does Putin perceive the risk of Russia becoming a junior partner in the relationship with China? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I th that's what I'm driving at, really, Bill, that, um, yeah. that behind the scenes, this is a tremendous gamble to say, I'm not going to do the normal thing in world politics that politicians did in the 19th century. I'm not going to play off one great power against another great power and see what benefit I can get from this. I'm going to say I'm friends with one great power and the enemy of another great power. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous uh, gamble uh, that I think the Chinese think um, they win. they're going to win hands down. I mean, you know, they're driving this new Silk Road across uh, Central Asia, mm -hmm. and the Russians can't utter a word of criticism about it for fear of losing their one great al ally in the world, which is which is China. So uh, I think sensible Russians uh, think this is um, a gamble too far, and Putin must know that this himself because ever since I've been going to uh, Russia, Russians have talked about the danger from their southern neighbor, China. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's something that, that goes very deep in the uh, Russian psyche, going back to the, the Mongol invasions of, of um, the uh, 13th century. Um, uh, Yes, that's a great question. I, I think uh, I think Putin is um, Putin is a is a ruler who's made several strategic mistakes, and this is one of the biggest. The um, Bob, I want to ask you. I, I want to remind everybody you're listening to Hoover Senior Fellow Robert Service. You can find more research 
by Hoover Fellows at hoover.org. I want to turn to the United States, Bob, uh, and Annalise Anderson, a colleague of yours and mine at the Hoover Institution, mm. asked the following question. Does Putin have any interest in a new U.S.-Russian treaty on nuclear weapons, perhaps, including China? I guess what she's really asking is, you know, what's the basis for a new Russian-United States reset? Well, uh, that's a really important question, too, uh, that Annalise has, has asked. And the Kremlin this week has been talking about a reset specifically on nuclear questions. Um, back in the days of Ronald Reagan, one of the factors that slowed the Soviet positive response to Reagan's initiatives was the fact that if the Soviet Union came to reduce its nuclear weaponry vis-a-vis -vis America and, and Europe, that would still leave a, a nuclear threat on the Soviet border from China. And that was in a period where the Chinese were militarily far, far weaker uh, than they are now. So the, the distinct interest that Russia has in a tripartite nuclear arms reduction treaty is very great indeed. And it is to be hoped this, you know, this could be one of the ways in which some of the tensions in geopolitics begin to subside if some way could be found to using talks about tripartite nuclear arms reduction, using that as a way of then spreading into softening Russia's um, aggressive and adventurist policies in other parts of uh, its policy program. Yeah, I think I, I think that's that's important, and we don't know yet whether this will come to anything. Let's hope that it does. Yeah. Any comments on the relationship between President Putin and President Trump? Well, I do. I mean, this is like a Charles Dickens mystery uh, novel. Uh, there's never been a, a time when great issues of state have been discussed by the American leader and the Russian or Soviet leader. And we, we know so little about the contents of the discussion. Uh, if you go back to the period of the great change in the relationship between the USSR and the US um, in the period of Ronald Reagan and George Shultz. Then both sides, both uh, the Soviets and the Americans, conducted their negotiations on the, on, the, on the basis that they had to pull their publics along with them. So there was greater transparency about what was being discussed. Now there have been, not very many, but I'm, I'm not sure if you can definitely call them summits, but there have been discussions at the top level, at the summit level, between President Trump and President Putin, but next to nothing is known about what they've agreed on, if they've agreed about anything. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a world where we need agreements, um, but we also need in the sort of modern societies in which we live, we need more transparency. We need more ventilation of great public issues. The public can't be just excluded mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the way that's happened um, recently 
and more has been disclosed by the Russians mm -hmm. than has been dis has been disclosed by the American administration, and it's it's not healthy, and uh, it's easy to, to do something about it, uh, and it needs. I think I personally think it needs to be done. Um, the American administration, though, has many, many is a many-headed one. So, uh, as well as President Trump uh, talking in a friendly fashion uh, about President Putin, the policy of helping the military defense of Ukraine has also been going on, has been continuing. Now, these are somewhat in conflict with each other. So not all American policy has been going in a single uh, direction. My, my, big, my big feeling is, though, that we need more ventilation um, than we've been having on both sides. Got it. Got it. Bob, I'm going to uh, change gears a little bit. Uh, Brid asked the following question. Does Robert believe that Russia has been uh, part of the successful internet campaigns for Donald Trump, Brexit, etc.? Where will they set their sights next? Will they be involved in the next election? Well, that's obviously a really important question, too. Um, I'm not an expert on American politics, um, uh, but I, when I was over in the summer of 2016, I could see lots of reasons why people wouldn't vote for uh, Hillary Clinton, apart from Russian meddling. But that said, there, has, there was definitely Russian meddling. and. Um, they meddled in the Russian, sorry, the, the British Brexit mm -hmm. campaign. They meddled in the French presidential election. They meddled in Italian politics. They've meddled in um, all manner of European uh, political processes. What has to be done, I think, is to lay down much more clearly in each country, but best of all, collectively, the threshold beyond which the Russians should not be able to uh, step. And one of the problems here is that... Um, a reciprocal assault on the Russian political system isn't really um, realistic because the result of the Russian presidential election is always known in advance. Mm -hmm. So no amount of meddling is going to destabilize that, at least in the elections that have happened uh, so far. But there ought to be penalties for uh, what's been going on so far, even when you might say, nevertheless, um, the results of Western elections would probably have been the same in mm -hmm. any case. Mm -hmm. I would say we ought to stand up for the integrity of our electoral processes much more robustly than we've done. Yeah. Um, in my country, the UK, a parliamentary report was produced back in October 2019 about Russian meddling. It has yet to be published. It is yet to be published. It's set up in typeface and has not been released by the government. Um, this is a sort of self-censorship that really doesn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. What's the, do you understand the source of the hesitancy to publish the report? Well, the suspicion is that uh, the current government, the current, current governing party um, 
had um, a closer relationship, or at least some of uh, some of its officials had a closer relationship with the Russian administration or supporters of the Russian administration than they sure to admit, yeah. want to disclose. Yeah. Uh, it may or may not be true, yeah. but um, that's the suspicion. Got it. Robert, we want to end by uh, reminding everybody that we've been talking in this series mostly about COVID-19. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, what's, what's Russia's experience been with COVID-19? Has their policies been effective? Have they been transparent with their population and with the world about sharing their, their experiences with coronavirus? Uh, that's, a, that's an important question of today. Uh, the official spokesman uh, himself has gone down with COVID. Um, the prime minister has gone down with COVID. The Kremlin, to start with, claimed that COVID was a foreign problem and that Russia was going to sail through the medical crisis unscathed in the way that uh, China and Europe and North America were being hit. The next the next uh, step on from that, when COVID really hit Russia, was to manipulate the figures and to issue figures of deaths and infections lower than the reality. And that's still the case today. So there is considerable fear in Russia about what they're being told by the authorities. And Putin has sensed the danger of this growing feeling um, by saying to the governors, it's up to you to solve the problem of the medical crisis in your regions. You, you get on with it. So he's sort of, he's, he's saying in this respect, the regions know best how to handle the regions and he's sort of walked away from the crisis but Russians have had a lot to put up with over the last few years the, the collapse of the oil price and then the the, uh, the the downturn in welfare benefits and the threat to pensions this has caused a lot of angst in uh, Russia. Not everyone feels very grateful to Putin anymore, mm -hmm. uh, if they did in the first place. And um, the COVID crisis could could have a, a, a political damaging effect um, if ever he did stand again to be president. Of course, he's got in his hands the ability to win the presidency without winning a, an electoral majority. He can always manipulate, emasculate the results. Yeah, that's the beauty of voting in Russia. Yeah. Got it. Bob, that was a wonderful discussion. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure, Tom. Thanks for the questions. You got it. From, from everybody. Great. Our next Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing will be Thursday, June 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time with Chiron Skinner. Chiron is the W. Glenn Campbell Research Fellow and recently served as a Senior Policy Advisor to Secretary Pompeo. We originally set up this briefing a few weeks ago to discuss foreign policy, but with the recent events surrounding the death of George Floyd, we will also ask her about some other current topics, including race in our country and recent calls to defund the nation's police departments. You can join Thursday's briefing at the same link that you signed in on today. Before I let you go, I'd like to tell you about our series called Hoover Capital Conversations, discussing policy with policymakers. This series brings together Hoover Institution Fellows and leading policymakers for informed discussions between those who generate ideas enabling a free society and those who turn them into actionable policy.
By bringing together the key players in policy development and policy execution, we hope to pull back the curtain on some of the discussions that have traditionally happened behind closed doors. The next conversation will be tomorrow, Wednesday, June 10th, at 12 p.m. Pacific time and 3 p.m. Eastern time, and will feature United States Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina and Hoover Senior Fellow and Medical Doctor Scott Atlas. They will be discussing the future of healthcare after COVID-19. You can sign up at hoover.org forward slash capital conversations to join this briefing. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Have a good day.